Aiden, round 12 of the AFL season is complete and the tag is officially back. We saw North Melbourne get their first win of the season and we saw that there might be a clear second premiership contender after the Swans. Welcome back to Chat Shit. Let's jump into the top five. My number five, surprisingly, is another defender. Probably my second one in 12 weeks. Noah Bolter is my number five. The stats won't show it, but I think he's one of the smartest intercept defenders going around. Always in the right position. I don't think Adelaide had any answer to him. It's sort of similar when Adelaide played Geelong much earlier in the season when Tom Stewart got a hold of him. I think Noah Bolter was always there, intercept marking, spoiling. They just couldn't find a way around him, and they really struggled to get past him. He's my number five. Love that call. He was amazing, and I love the respect for the defenders. Former centre-half back at heart. My number five player of the round was Eric Hipwood. Who what, that must have been tough. I know you're not a fan. <laughs> hey, we'd love to have you on the pod, Eric. Um, uh, we we saw an incredible display from Eric. Six goals, twenty touches. He just dominated against the Bulldogs. It was a dominant display from Brisbane generally, uh, but Eric Hipwood was just they, they they couldn't stop him, and so had to pay some respect. Well, I had him at number number three. Like yeah, seven marks inside fifty. The best game he's probably ever had in a in a Lions shirt and tore tore the game apart. My my number four was, was Jai Simkin. Uh, like last week, I love game winners. Guys that, that show up at the end of the game and can, can bring their team home. He <coughs> kicked two goals in crucial parts of the final quarter, especially that, that last one after the dodgy tackle on, on Elliot Yo, which probably wasn't holding the ball. Alongside 28 disposals, 12 contested possessions, 5 clearances and 7 tackles. Very much deserved top 5 player of the round. Completely agree. I didn't have him in there. And number four, I actually have a different North Melbourne player. I have Harry Sheasel at number four. Yeah. He, we saw, we, we talked earlier in the season about how they should get him further up the ground. Well, we saw the impact that he can have when they do that. He played as a forward half midfielder and a part-time half forward. A goal, 30 touches with five tackles. Uh, we saw him get a goal and four assists, four goal assists, which, which is just huge. And we know that with his kicking ability, his vision, his composure, that is go you're gonna that he's gonna have those performances when they get him further up the field, and it was amazing to see uh, Simpkin and the captain and then the youngster and Sheezel lead them to that win. Ah, uh, my oh, number yeah, three yeah. was Hipwood. My number three, I think, is a guy you might have a little bit higher, Marcus Windhager, or you don't have him in there. I didn't have him in there because I'm, I'm going to talk about him later. Okay, I won't, I won't talk too much about the tagging around the league because we're going to have a really fun discussion about that later. But Windhager was phenomenal. Uh, locked down Tuuk Miller and I love that he chose to go to Tuuk Miller or Ross Lyon chose to put him to Tuuk Miller because uh, it's, it's I think a lot of people would tag Noah Anderson as a guy that breaks away from stoppage and maybe had, had, like really damages the opposition team but I think they just went Tuuk Miller that's their leader that's their barometer let's just lock him down and we I've never seen a, a game that quiet from Tuuk Miller in, in years so. I like it I like it my number two you might not like it but I just couldn't have too many swans on the list Goulden, Heaney, and Warner are my number two. 89 disposals, five goals, 34 score involvements, 28 contested possessions, 14 clearances, four goal assists, and I proposed the triple tag. <laughs> They're my number two of the round. I couldn't, I didn't want to have too many of them in because it would be Swans dominant, would feel biased, so they're all sitting at number two. You know, there was chat during the week that Geelong would pull the triple tag, but they did the zero tag. Well, I heard, about, I heard about a potential double tag. I think the triple tag might be a bit excessive. I think they tried to tag Goulden, but it really just didn't work because he just runs too hard. I think they tried to put blitz arms on yeah, him to try and lock him He's fully down to one one change in the game at the moment. I will say, I had Errol Goulden as my number one player of the round. That's fair enough. Uh, see, just the one thing that sticks with me from this performance and what, what made it stand out so much to me is so you have the damage on the offensive side and just with the ball a goal 37 disposals 15 score involvements so many more than anyone else in the game uh, and he's top 3 in the league for score involvements per game Heaney Warner and Goulden are the top 3 in the league in that stat uh, I just checked that this morning okay. uh, for average score involvements uh, but Errol Goulden while having that impact with the ball how often did we see him when Geelong broke away he gets back to full back and covers and becomes that extra man his work rate is unbelievable. If you just follow him across the ground, when he's working back to defend, he'll just sprint past, sprint past 40 guys on the field. It's it's unreal to have that sort of guy as a leader in your team, as a 21-year-old, and it was just an all-around incredible performance. I love it. I love it. My number one was, was Lockie Neal. Two goals, 38 disposals, six score involvements, 10 clearances. It is now a non-negotiable. You need to tag him. And he was my number two. Fair, fair enough. You have to tag him. He's not a hard... Like we've seen in the past, he's not a hard guy to tag. 
just get a run with player um, for the game and his stats will not look anything like this, but we'll talk about, a, talk about him a bit later. We'll move on to the next segment, which is every AFL team's most important player. Starting with Adelaide, I've got Isaac Rankin. Now, he obviously was hit with a hamstring injury, but I believe he was in all Australian form before that. And he's just sort of Adelaide's difference in midfield. It's a lot of the same when, when he's not there. Um, and he just brings that X factor, that, that little bit of a difference, the run the run out of midfield. He can go forward. He, he's a star, uh, a small forward. And he's just a guy that they're, they're missing at the moment. So he's, I think, their most important player. Brisbane, I said Lockie Neal. I think I'm going to say it. I think he's the best player in the league, if not tagged. I think we've seen what can happen if, if teams decide, oh, we're too good to tag him, we don't have a tagger. He just puts up 35-plus uh, disposals, sometimes chips in with a goal, loads of score involvements, and I believe when he's not tagged, by far their most important player. Carlton, this was tough because they got a lot of important players, but I've actually gone Kerno. Doesn't matter what game, he's always going to have the best forward on him. Lock him in for two goals a week. He's always going to be competitive. He's never going to be out of it. I think he's... He's had two plus in every game this week. he's potentially on for his second, maybe first at the moment, but in a goal every game, consecutive games. Yep. And he also is going for the... If he gets the Coleman this year, it would be the first time for, oh, I don't know how many decades, that someone has won three straight Coleman's. Wow. And yeah, I just think they have other stars all around the field, but lock this guy in against the other team's best defender for two plus goals a week. Collingwood, I've gone Nick Dacos. Now he's also a guy that you, ha you have to tag now, but the amount of games this guy wins for Collingwood at such a young age, just the, the run through the midfield, you can stick him in half back, you can put him in the forward line, and he's always gonna pop up with, with great stats. Essendon, I've gone Zach Merritt. Uh, now four, like, he's also, now it's pretty consistent because these are the most important players, but he's a forced tag. If you're getting tagged, you're probably pretty important. Um, he brings pressure, his field kicking's elite, and he knows how to lift the team. You see he'll make an elite tackle, and, and the team will really, really get behind him. He's really added that to his game. I think he got 11, 12 tackles this week, which we didn't see from him a couple of years ago when he was still an All-Australian midfielder. 100%, 100%. For Frio, I've said Pierce, their general. They rely on their def defense a lot with a very forward-thinking forward, uh, forward -thinking midfield, and, and he always steps up. I, I can't remember a time he's been... Uh, outclassed or beaten this season by, by a forward. So yeah, Alex Pierce. For Geelong, I've said Patrick Dangerfield. I almost said uh, Max Holmes, but I think he's honestly what brings their midfield together. Without him, I think the losses are just going to keep coming and they, they're desperate to have him back. The experience in, in the midfield. He's still at his age. He's still a guy that can run through tackles. He's a midfield bull. He's going to attack. He's going he's gonna to force the ball forward. He's going to kick goals. Huge, a guy that's really important to them at the moment. For Gold Coast, this was also really tough. I could have picked about five different players, but I've got Sam Collins. I think he's one of the best intercept defenders in the league. Lock him in for an eight, eight out of 10 every week. He's on the best forward every week and always does a good job. Some of, the, some of the midfielders can be tagged out of the game. This guy never has a bad game. For GWS, I've actually gotten Tom Green. When he's off, GWS is off. We've seen at the start of the season, GWS were five or six and oh. He was having unbelievable games. He's not even being tagged. He's just off at the moment. And since his, his sort of off run of form, GWS are really struggling to win games. So that, that's my first nine teams, most important players. For Hawthorne, I've gone with Will Day. And I think it's undeniable. This form that we've seen with the Hawks, it's coincided with the return of Will Day. And the Hawks are playing like one of the best teams in the league. They're unstoppable at the moment. Uh, Six of the last eight, including a one-point loss to the Port Adelaide Power. Uh, Will Day is a bit of a freak in the midfield. He's just so athletic, and to start performing the way he has after a uh, interrupted early season is amazing. For Melbourne, I've gone Jake Lever. Uh, did you? Would, were you thinking yeah. him as well? I've got a name for everyone here as well. Yeah. So I think we see their defence often collapse a little bit when he's not when he's not in the team when he's out with injury, uh, and it's. A, defense that's been so dominant in the league for a few years when they've been in this premiership window. And I think Jake Lever is the real leader in that defense. Uh, I, I could have said Stephen May as well, but I went with Jake Lever. For North, I'm looking more more important to their team in the long run because cool. I don't know if anyone's really contributing to winning right now. I've gone with Harry Sheasel. Uh, for Port Adelaide, I've gone with Zach Butters because I think Port Adelaide's real difference maker and what can lead them to, to potentially win a premiership in this next few years is that young midfield. Butters, Horn Francis, Connor Rosie, and Zach Butters, I think he, he could be the best of all of them. 
the the agility, the ability to change direction. Uh, we saw that when he can pull that out in fourth quarters, uh, late in the game when everyone's tired, he just keeps running and he can be so important for that team. For Richmond, I've gone with Tom Lynch, who obviously isn't playing at the moment, but I think that that forward line becomes so dynamic and hard to stop when you have Shea Bolton and Tom Lynch both in there. Uh, and we see that while he's not playing, the team's the team's not scoring a lot of goals and is not playing very good footy. Um, I know that there's a lot of other contributing factors, other injured players, but I think Tom Lynch is their most important player. For St Kilda, I've gone with Callum Wilkie. Similar to the Alex Pierce call, uh, Frio and St Kilda are both teams where their defence is the most important aspect. It's it's their A card. And Callum Wilkie is an, now all-Australian defender and a really good key back. Uh, Errol Goulden I've gone with for the Swans. It was so difficult. I tossed up about seven different blokes here. I said Brody Grundy at points. I said Chad Warner at points. I said Tom McCartan at points. But Errol Goulden, bit of recency bias, but this most recent performance, the way that he can, is clearly a leader for this team and leads by example with his effort, desperate to play 100%, uh, 100% game time as a midfielder, which is just unheard of, and has a 21-year-old. It's, it's, just, uh, it's, it's really exciting as a Swans fan, and I think he's going to be extremely important for probably over a decade. For the Bulldogs, I've gone with Marcus Bontempelli, and I don't think there's a lot to be said there. Uh, arguably the best player in the league. Should have a brown low by now, and uh, just brings everything to that midfield and the forward line when he's there. And for West Coast, similar to North, looking forward to their most important players, it's Harley Reid. Uh, he's freakish, uh, he's special, and he's going to be the, the key to their, to their rebuild. Let's move on to hits and misses. The tag is is officially back. We're seeing it all over the competition now. We saw Chincotta on Merritt. We saw Jordan on Stewart. Uh, help me here. Windhager on Wind Tuke Miller. On, on Tuke Miller. We're seeing battles all over the ground. We're seeing players being taken out of the game. We saw oh, Neil Bullen on Dacos Day as well. I love it. I think if you can take a player in your team who's not one of your, your top liners and take out one of their top liners, it's a huge tactical advantage if you can take away their weapon. And the fact that we went a few years before this not seeing the tag being implemented all the time hugely surprises me. Yeah. But not only, like, it's just about the battle. The craft to try and beat the tag versus the tagger balancing, impacting his team versus impacting the target. I absolutely, I just love watching the battle. There was just an, some awesome footage of Neil Bullen following Dacos about 170 meters. Yeah, yeah to, to stop in front yeah. of goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To stop a to stop a goal, and it's uh, it's just awesome to see. And we should change our channel name to something to do with tagging because it's all we talk about. Oh, but okay. We just love it. My hit uh, was we finally saw the Mackay versus Mackay battle. We've seen they've been in the league together for seven, eight years now and they've never played against each other because one of them's always been injured or in the VFL or suspended or something. Maths finales, the ashes, all the lot. <laughs> Should we show that photo? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll show that photo. Show, yeah. we'll show. Pause your screen. It's right here. Have a look. All the reasons why they haven't been able to play each other. But um, we, we finally saw the battle and it was heated. Unfortunately, we saw that Ben Mackay actually put a bit of a hand into... Um, Harry's yeah, head let him play man. Shoved, shoved his head into the ground and he went off with a possible concussion but uh, so I, I don't know what the what mum's going to say about that but <laughs> I, I well, someone at, uh, someone I was watching the footy with said just get the umpires off the field and let mum sort it out <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny so that, that was my hit for the week I love it my miss well, it's pretty simple but Gold Coast just can't win away it's now over 12 months since they got an away win their record at home is spotless. Their record away is horrific. 7-0 and 0-6. When have we seen something like that before? The the different, like the grounds aren't that different. The crowds aren't that huge in the Gold Coast. How we can see, I don't know if it's a mental thing now that they just feel like they can't win an away game, but it's going to com- it's hugely impacting their season. Yeah. And if you even turn three of those away games into wins, they, they push so much higher up the table. So yeah, it's unfortunate. My miss is just Melbourne and their downfall this season. Uh, it's a little bit dramatic, but when we look at the last couple of weeks, the 92-point loss to Frio was was horrendous, and they needed a bounce back. If, if they couldn't stand up for, for the Neil Danaher game uh, against Collingwood at the MCG on, on the King's birthday after that loss, then when are they going to stand up? And we, didn't, we saw Collingwood sort of just run over them. You had Nick Dacos, their best player, not having that much of an impact, and Melbourne still... They just couldn't get anything going. 
top end talent all over the field. Maybe not the forward line, but top end talent everywhere. And they just they're getting run over. So is this the end of Melbourne's premiership window? Can they make finals this year? We'll have to see. Well, with Petrarca now confirmed out for at least I think four or five weeks, they're really going to struggle. We'll move on to the footy pyramid. There are two outs this week. Nick Blakey is out of the pyramid. Ridiculous. Christian Petrarca is out of the pyramid. He drops two tiers, except I'm just I'm just going to take him out now because he's going to lose to the injury. Which means we have two new wins. Lockie Neal is back in the pyramid. He seems to be seesawing in and out. It just depends on if he gets tagged or not. Will Day is now in the pyramid. Wow. I believe he's a top 15 player in the competition. How one guy can change a team that much, just really impressive to me and just consistent performer. Sam Walsh holds his position in the fifth tier. And Luke Ryan and Zach Butters don't lose to the bye. They hold the position in the fifth tier. Moving down into the fourth tier is Paddy Cripps. Had, had one of his more quiet games. Max Gorn moves up a tier, which is probably the only shining light for, for Melbourne yesterday. Kono, back where he belongs in, in the fourth tier. And Zach Merritt holds his spot. Nick Dacos moves down a tier. He's off the second tier. He got absolutely smashed by the tag. Oh, I know. He's, he's now in the third tier. Marcus Bontempelli moves down from the second tier. He's also now in the third tier. And Sarong moves up <laughs> into, the, into the third tier. Call me biased all you want, but there is one team that's, that's ruining the competition at the moment. Moving up two tiers into the second tier is Errol Golden. Alongside him, moving up one tier is Chad Warner. Sitting on the peak of the pyramid is Isaac Heaney. Argue with it all you want, but this midfield is by far the best midfield in the league. We're by far the best team in the league. We saw yesterday what can happen when we get a bit of momentum and these midfielders get going. Chad Warner kicked a goal. Heaney went bang. Heaney went bang again. And it just we just run through teams. You can argue with all you want. These are the best three players in the league. And I understand that it's just people saying things, but we have people in the Melbourne media who don't tend to favour teams like the Swans, those interstate teams, saying that those are the three most... Uh, most impressive and best players in the league right now. Matthew Lloyd said that they might be the best three players in the league. We've heard David King say it over the last week. So I don't think that's biased, Aiden. I love it. I just think Nick Blakey needs to be in the pyramid. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a reaction to that. I saw a reaction to that. Uh, now let's head into the power rankings. In 18th is North Melbourne. They get their first win, but they do still sit in 18th place. And they should be very happy with their win, but understand that they still sit in 18th. They did just beat a smashed up West Coast. They did. In 17th, I have Richmond, who are get, who also got a win. How exciting is this? Wow. But they got a win against Adelaide, who have been very unimpressive recently. And uh, I think that they still have to have to show something more than one game to get out of 17th. In 16th, I have West Coast, who yet a bit beat up. Uh, we know that we're not going to get consistent performances out of them, and we're just trying to see flashes this year, and we're seeing that. So they should be pretty happy. In 15th, I have Adelaide, who will be very unhappy People had them making the top four at the start of the year in the preseason, and now they now sit in about 14th or 15th on the ladder, uh, just losing to Richmond there. A beat-up Richmond is going to be devastating for their fans that had any hopes of bringing back the season. In 13th, I have St Kilda. Still unable to score, scored another 51 points, but got the win, and you have to respect it. Um, they need to be able to score, though, if they want any chance of, of being a, a team that anyone's afraid of. 13th, Melbourne. What are you meant to say about it? They are playing really poor football, getting dominated by whoever they come up against over the last few weeks, and I don't know if they're going to be able to make finals, to be honest. In 12th, I have Gold Coast, and you just don't know where to put them. As you say, when they're at home, are they the number one contender to the Sydney Swans? If they played at People's First Stadium all 24 games? If the grand final was at People's First Stadium? But, uh, yeah, they, you can't be higher than this if you're 0-6 away from home. Uh, in 11th place on the power rankings, I have Brisbane, who get a beautiful win against the Bulldogs, but it's the same story with Brisbane this year. No consistency. Uh, they've had a couple, they had a 100-point win against Gold Coast and then a really bad loss, and now a 40-point win against the Bulldogs, and you're just not sure what to make of them. Uh, I, don't think they're a prem- I, I don't think they're a premiership contender. I don't think they have that in them, but they still have a chance to sneak into the eight. In 10th, I have Geelong, who... Honestly, played well against Sydney, I thought. Got out to a hot start, and then Sydney just outclassed them at home. But they don't have any experienced midfielders right now. Chris Scott spoke really eloquently about it after the game. You sent me that to watch, and I watched that. And Chris Scott described it beautifully that 
you have like Tanner Bruin, um, Jack Bowes, Ocean Mullen, all these young guys who are really giving it a go and getting better every week, but they don't have a single experienced midfielder outside of Tom Atkins in there at the moment. And it's just not going to be able to win a lot of games. In ninth, I have the Bulldogs, who like 115 percentage just doesn't mean much if you're going to win five out of your first 12 games. So Bulldogs, they, they don't perform. Uh, they don't perform when they're needed to. And we see them sometimes get these huge scalps against good teams, like they beat Collingwood last week, and then we see this the next week. Can't string anything together. In eighth, I've got Port Adelaide, who, did they beat the bye or lose to the bye? They beat the bye by one spot. They, beat, they go off one spot. Uh, so I think this is about where they sit. Maybe they should be a little bit higher. We need to see their, their forward line fire a bit and, and uh, support their midfield if they want to make a charge towards the top four. In seventh, we have Essendon, who now have a couple of losses on the spin, uh, and they will not be... I think they'll be very scared, Essendon fans. They had such a hot start uh, and and maintained that, but they now have a less than 100 percentage, uh, and they sit in third or fourth place. It's it's really strange. Uh, in, in sixth, I have GWS, who just got a beautiful win against Geelong, and now they had this loss, and it's... Well, they're not playing their best footy, but they just are so good everywhere that I just keep them there in the hope. Not in the hope, but just in the feeling that they'll come good. In fifth, we have the Hawthorne Hawks. Moving up two spots. Moving up two spots. I like it. And I absolutely love watching them play. Favourite team to watch outside of the Swans at the moment. And just what else can you say about them? Just just exciting and electric. In fourth, I have Fremantle, who lose to the bye because of a couple of really good performances from a couple of Melbourne teams. Uh, big premiership contenders but Frio are doing everything right at the moment in third I have Collingwood um, a big win against Melbourne jumps them up into third again and we know that they're a premiership contender they will be there at the pointy end of the season someone else who would be bitterly disappointed if they won't be there at the pointy end of the season is Carlton moving up six spots moving up six spots that I don't think that reflects their performance I think it reflects that I had them too low last week they they have continued to impress me this week and I had to pay them the respect that they deserve. They are probably the second best contender after the Swans. Uh, and I think Carlton and Collingwood are, are the two biggest contenders to the Swans when it comes to the Premiership. And in one, we have the Swans, who can't put a foot wrong at the moment. Came back from 30 points down to win by 30. And that is the power rankings for this week. We'll see you all on the next one.